we come today to chapter 2 in the Gospel of Matthew. If you have your Bible, you'll want to turn there with us. And as you do, I urge you to use our notes and outlines if you have them. If you do not, write in and ask for them. We have a set for you. And then we have a book on Matthew that will be very helpful. I think it's the best study book that I've done, very candidly. And I consider it a very important study because Matthew is one of the key books of the Bible. And it's certainly the key book of the New Testament. Now, as we come to the second chapter of Matthew, we have here the visit of the wise men after the birth of the Lord Jesus and then the flight into Egypt and the return to Nazareth. Now, all of this is that which took place historically. But back of this is a tremendous truth that's being presented here that you don't want to miss. Now, as we've said before, that each one of the Gospels was directed to meet the needs of a particular group of people. The Gospel of Matthew was written to the nation Israel. It's for religious people. Now, you have here recorded the fulfillment of four prophecies, and that actually is the purpose, I think, of chapter 2 of Matthew. And you have here about seven or eight Old Testament scriptures that were fulfilled at the birth of Jesus. Now, let me just gather them up, and then we'll see how they were fulfilled at the time of Christ. And I'm sure that there were many sincere students of the Word in Christ's day that wondered how all of these things could be fulfilled. And it just looked rather difficult. And first, the Old Testament said that he was to be born in Bethlehem. That's in Micah 5, 2. He's to be called out of Egypt. That's in Hosea 11, 1. There was to be weeping in Ramah. And Ramah is just about as far north of Jerusalem as Bethlehem is south of Jerusalem. And if he's born in Bethlehem, why do they weep in Ramah? And that's in Jeremiah 31, 15. And then to cap all of this off, we have in this chapter the fact that he went up to Nazareth. Well, that fulfilled prophecy. He's to be called a Nazarene. And that was in Isaiah 11, 1. Now, the question is, How could all of these be fulfilled in a little baby that was born in that day? And Matthew shows how literally and accurately and easily all were fulfilled without any strain on prophecy or history or on anyone. It just came about as God said it would come about. Now, that ought to give us an indication of the fact that in our day, there are certain prophecies that relate to the second coming of Christ, and it's difficult for many of us to correlate these. We find it difficult to see how all can be fulfilled and in the way they can be fulfilled. Now, I'm of the opinion that when we come to that time, and we will one of these days, we're going to find out that it all took place in a very normal, natural way, and that it all looked like a jigsaw puzzle to us down here. And when we get into his presence and it's all fulfilled, it'll be just as natural as this. It'll be every little piece of the jigsaw puzzle fitted into place, and we're going to wonder why in the world didn't we see it at the time. Now let's look at this and see how it came to pass And I'm confident that's the reason Matthew recorded these things concerning the birth of the Lord Jesus. I'm reading now Matthew 2, verse 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now, let's look at that for just a moment. This is the record of the coming of the wise men. And when they came, they wanted to know where he was born. And we'll see that in the next verse. The one who's king of the Jews. 
And it was in the days of Herod the king. One thing that Herod didn't want, that was competition. And there was one thing that he would not tolerate, and that was competition. So this really alerted him when these wise men came into Jerusalem. Let me come back up and take a look at this verse again, and will you notice it very carefully? Behold, there came three wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Is that what your Bible says? You say, no, you've inserted three. Well, isn't that what you have been taught, at least from Christmas cards? I think a great many people know more about the Christmas story from Christmas cards than they do from the Bible. And they've got so many things inaccurate from the Christmas cards. I had a class many years ago. I was teaching Bible, and this class was a very talented class. I was teaching Matthew, and they came up with a Christmas card. And they had in it everything that I attempted to correct. And there are about five or six things. I'll attempt to correct several of them right here in this chapter. First of all, you will notice it was not three wise men. And I make this suggestion. I don't know how many there were. But I don't think, first of all, that three wise men would have disturbed Herod or have excited Jerusalem. I do believe that 300 would have. And these wise men who came from the east, evidently they came from all different sections. They'd been studying the stars, and they'd seen a star, and they'd gathered together, and they came to Jerusalem. Now, I'm of the opinion it was nearer 300 than three. But don't say that I said 300 because I didn't. I don't know how many there were. I'm almost sure it wasn't three. Now, they came to Jerusalem saying, "'Where is he that is born king of the Jews?' They're looking for a king. And that's the thing that alerted Herod the king. And this is the thing they say, "'For we have seen his star in the east, and we've come to worship him.'" There's some folk that are going to get a little disturbed at what I'm going to say now, but it needs to be said. They said, "'We've seen his star in the east.'" In poetry, that's called the Eastern Star. Actually, there's an organization called the Eastern Star, And the all-worshipful master of that group was a member of my church in Nashville, and she got greatly upset when I told this, but it needs to be said. We've seen a star in the east. Was it an eastern star? No, if they had seen his star in the east, and it had been an eastern star, they'd have ended up in India, China. The star was in the west. They were in the east. You notice what it says, we have seen his star in the east. Or let me put it like this, we have seen in the east his star. And that might be the better way to translate it. We've seen his star in the east. may give you the impression it was an eastern star, but we have seen in the east his star. The star was in the west. They followed it, and they came west. Not east, you see. They didn't go that direction at all. That's one correction we'd like to make because there's so much said of the eastern star. My question is, how in the world did they associate a star with a king and how did they identify it with Israel? Well, all I know is that they had a prophecy in the east, in that section, a prophecy given by Balaam that's recorded back in the 24th chapter of the book of Numbers at verse 17, and it says this. And you remember old Balaam gave these prophecies concerning the nation Israel. Here's the prophecy I'm reading. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. Now, you notice what the prophecy says, there shall come a star out of Jacob, that is, the nation Israel. 
and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. The star and the scepter go together, you see. And that's the only place I know where they are put together back in prophecy in the Old Testament. And they, the wise men out of the East, had that. And these men came out of the mysterious East with this question. Now, notice that it did disturb the city of Jerusalem and old King Herod. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Now, I think that converged on the city of Jerusalem, this great epidemic of wise men. Just think, a parade of three wise men would not be very impressive. But you let 300 of them come traipsing into the city of Jerusalem and asking a question like this, and the whole city is going to be disturbed. Now, Herod wants to know about this. And he's a very superstitious man. He is Herod the Great. And I can't take time for this, but if you have a good Bible dictionary... You remember at the very beginning of this study, I recommended that you get a good Bible dictionary. And if you have one, why, turn to the Herod family. And if you want to read about a bunch of rascals, they were a bunch of rascals. You have in that family a real first century mafia. They are like the house of Medici, the house of Herod, who are made up of rascals. But here's the biggest rascal of all. He had bought this position from the Roman government. He was an Idumean, by the way. He was not of Israel at all. And so he's anxious to know. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. He didn't ask them. He demanded. He said, I know that you have scriptures and In that, why, you have a record of a Messiah that's coming, and I want to know where he's to be born. And they were able to tell him. Now, that is one of the amazing things. Verse 5, And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it's written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Now, when he asked the scribes this question, they didn't have to get their Scripture down and turn pages and spend five minutes trying to find the passage. They knew where it was. Micah 5, 2. They went right to it. In fact, the matter is, they didn't need to go to it. They had it in their mind. They could quote it. They knew all about the coming of the Messiah. The only problem is their knowledge was academic. It certainly was not vital. It was not meaningful to them. You would think that since they knew the Old Testament Scriptures, and there's an example, a man who can know the history, they can know certain factual truths, but it carried no meaning for them, or you would have thought they would have got on the back of the camels and taking a trip out of Jerusalem to Bethlehem. It's not very far down there. You'd think they would have said to the wise men, how about letting us ride down with you? We are looking for the Messiah too. I wonder today how many people really are looking for the coming of the Lord, who even talk about it and know a great deal about prophecy. Would you really like to see him right now? Uh, Suppose, friends, that he broke in right today where you are with what you're doing. Would he interrupt anything? Would you like to say to him, well, I wish you'd postpone your visit to some other time? Well, these men were not prepared for his coming, that's sure. Now, Herod's got his information. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. Now, I'm going to make this statement now and try to prove it later, that the star had appeared sometime before they arrived. You see, they made the trip by camel, not by jet plane. And it's a long ways across that desert. I'm of the opinion that they did not arrive in Jerusalem until at least a year 
after the appearance of the star. You see, theirs wasn't just a little Christmas celebration. They had been hanging to that hope as they crossed that desert to come and see him, and they were bringing gifts to him. Now, will you notice, he inquired diligently, and keep that in mind. That'll be important when we get to that next time. Now, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. When ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. And here's just about as subtle a thing as possibly could have been said by this old serpent here. And that's exactly what old Herod was. You see, if he had said, Well, I tell you, if there's a king born around here, I'll do something about it. Suppose he had sent soldiers down there. He wouldn't have found where the child was born, I can assure you. He knew that he'd be hidden. And he knew the best way to do and the clever way was to let these wise men go down there and find him. And then he urged them to come back and tell him that he wanted to go down and worship him. And, of course, what he really wanted to do was to kill him. Now, verse 9, "...when they had heard the king, they departed." And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them. Now the star appears again. They must have traveled a long time without seeing the star. Now it appears again, and that ought to answer all of this nonsense. Every Christmas season, a magazine or the magazine section of our newspaper comes out with an article about some astronomer of what really the wise men saw, and there was the confluence of certain stars at that particular time, and that was it. The very interesting thing is that Matthew makes it clear that this star is a rather unusual star. Or let me put it in very matter-of-fact language, this is a supernatural star and you do not explain it by modern astronomy. Let's rule that out. This is miraculous, and it's presented on that kind of a basis. And don't attempt to find the explanation in all of this. Now, I think maybe all that's interesting. And apparently, from what many of the astronomers have said, there was quite a movement in the heavens at that time. You see, when he came... Heaven and earth both responded to his coming into this world. And I think that actually did take place, but that's not what these wise men saw. Now, verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Now, when they arrived, Jesus was not in a stable back of an inn. When they were coming to the house... You see, the great movement of people in the city of Bethlehem had all now dissipated. They had all gone back to their homes. The enrollment was over. But you see, this little baby had been born, and they couldn't move him for a while. And I'm of the opinion that a trip of a little fella that age would have jeopardized his life. And so they had stayed there. And when they were coming to the house... And in the meantime, they had moved into a house. They saw the young child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, this is a remarkable passage of Scripture, and I want you to notice it. Most of the pictures I've seen show the wise men coming into the stable Well, unless Joseph pointed that stable out to them, they never knew where it was. They didn't go there. They came to the house. And when they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, notice how accurately this stated, they fell down and worshiped who? They worshiped him. If there ever was a time when Mary should have been worshiped, this was it. But they didn't worship her. They were wise men. And they worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gold and frankincense and myrrh. And I think one of the very interesting things that you have here is the fact that it is second coming. And Isaiah is the one that tells us this in Isaiah 66, 
The multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. All they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. Now, that's a prophecy of his second coming. What's left out? Myrrh. Why didn't they bring myrrh? That speaks of his death. When he comes the second time, nothing will speak of his death. Gold speaks of his birth. He's born a king. Frankincense speaks of the fragrance of his life. And myrrh here speaks of his death. All of it's wrapped up in the gifts that were brought to him at this time. But myrrh will not be brought the last time, the next time he comes, because the next time he won't come to die upon a cross for the sins of the world. Now, verse 12 says, "...and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Now, the wise men assumed that Herod was sincere when he said he wanted to know about the child, and he'd come down and worship him. Well, if he came down, he would slay the child, of course. Had not the angel of the Lord warned them, the wise men would have gone back by Jerusalem and given the good news to Herod, and believe me, he would have killed the child. Now we find that they are alerted, and they go another direction to their own country. They could continue south down to Hebron and then cross over the south of the Dead Sea. They'd be out of the range of Herod altogether. Now the angel of the Lord also appeared to Joseph and told him it's time now to get out of Bethlehem because Herod is going to attempt to kill the child. And now Joseph, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And he was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. And that's Hosea 11.1. 1. And that's a marvelous prophecy because it has a historical basis. Out of Egypt the son was called, which was the nation. And out of Egypt the son was called, who is a person. And this person here, and this is the prophecy. He went down there and stayed, Joseph did, and took the young child and the mother. Now we read verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise man, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise man. A part of what I'm going to say now is supposition. But part, of course, is based upon good solid fact here. We've made the statement before that the wise men did not arrive at the same time that the shepherds did. The wise men came later. Now, I know in a church pageant that down one aisle the shepherds come, and down the other aisle why the wise men come. They didn't get that close together, and they didn't come at the same time. The wise men arrived. And we found out last time, verse 11, when they were coming to the house, they'd moved into the house by then. Now, when Herod had inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared, and I suppose that they said, well, it was about a year ago. Because, you see, these wise men came from all quarters of the east, and I think they met in a certain place and then made their trek across the desert, and came to Jerusalem. And that would consume a great deal of time. In that day, they didn't travel by jet. They traveled by camel. And some camels have one hump, and some have two humps. And at best, you see, it would be the one-cylinder or two-cylinder job. So they didn't get there until quite a bit afterward. Now, Herod had asked when they saw the star. 
But when he slays all the children in that area from two years old and under, I would say this, and this is the part that supposition, Herod is so angry, and he's actually mad, by the way, that the wise man didn't come back and tell him. And he sees that he's been taken in by the wise man, that they were not cleverer than he thought they were, but they had a message from the Lord because they would have gone by and told him. But now, in his anger, I think just double. He said, well, if they said it was a year ago they saw the star, we'll just double it and make it two years and kill all the children under two years. Now we are told in verse 17, "...then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard." lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. Now, this is an unusual prophecy also. Jeremiah didn't say, in Bethlehem was there a voice heard. Now, was there a voice heard in Bethlehem? I think so. But you see, Jeremiah had said in Ramah, and that was up in his country, by the way, and Ramah's just about as far north of Jerusalem as Bethlehem is south of Jerusalem. And again, I rather think that when the soldiers said, or the captain said to Herod, well, whereabouts do you want me to begin? And what about slaying these children? What area? And I think old Herod said, well, just draw a circle around Jerusalem and make the radius of it as far south as Bethlehem and go north as far, and it included Ramah in the north. And Ramah wasn't even involved in it. So you see that Herod slew a great many children. And you can imagine the weeping in the Jerusalem area all the way from Bethlehem to Ramah. And that would be a radius of about 10, 12 miles, and it would be 20 to 25 miles across that area. So it must have been a time of great weeping on the part of these people when they lost their little ones. Now, this prophecy, you see, was literally fulfilled. Now we are told, but when Herod was dead, this is verse 19, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. And I must call attention to this. We're told that the angel of the Lord appeared to Jacob at Peniel. And now it's an angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ. But you see, he's gone down now to Egypt. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For they are dead which sought the young child's life. Now, it's essential to get him out of the land of Egypt, back up into that land. The most important reason is that he has been born under the law, and he is to live under the Mosaic law. He is the only one who really ever kept it. And we find that he's to come back, therefore, and get out from under the influence of Egypt, because, again, He's not to be raised down there as Moses had been raised and as the children of Israel had become a nation down there. Now he's told, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. And when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod. And by the way, Archelaus, another Herod, very brutal. He was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, you find that is a Fulfillment, And actually here, the netzer, or the branch, or the root, as it were, is Isaiah 11, 1. 
Isaiah 53, 2, or Psalm 22, 6. All of that why you have in this term Nazarene. But you see, he's given the term not only because he's a root out of the stem of Jesse, but he's brought up in Nazareth. And he's called a Nazarene, which fulfills the prophecy. Now, all of these four scriptural locations are fulfilled. It's as it were that he touched the base in all of these places. And what seemed a rather strange prophecy becomes now a reality, a very sane reality. And it was fulfilled in a very normal way. Now, that brings us, friends, to the third chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And now we are introduced to John the Baptist, the forerunner of the king. He announces the kingdom and baptizes Jesus the king. Now, we have, therefore, a very remarkable chapter here. And the kingdom of heaven will come before us again. I want to turn now and read Verse 1, chapter 3 of Matthew, and I'm reading now. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, all of a sudden, on the page of Scripture walks John the Baptist. And if we only had Matthew's gospel... Why, we had asked the question, where did he come from? What's his background? Because Matthew gives us none of that. And the reason is obvious. To begin with, he was to be announced. Malachi had said that the messenger would come ahead to tell about the coming of the king. He says, I send my messenger. And this messenger was John the Baptist. And a messenger is not one that you need to know about his background at all. John the Baptist was a messenger. When the Western Union boy brings a message to your door, do you say to him, young man, did your ancestors come over on the Mayflower? What is your background? You're not interested in that. You're interested in his message. The message is all important, and that's what you want. And you thank the boy, probably give him a tip and dismiss him. You're through with him. And John the Baptist makes it very clear that he was just the messenger. And Matthew's making that clear too. And therefore, he just walks out on the page of Scripture, comes preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, and this is his message, repent ye. It's a message of repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I think probably that we ought to deal with these two expressions that are very important, repent ye, and the kingdom of heaven, and I think probably is at hand. These are all very important. Repent is an expression that's always been given to God's people to turn around. Repent means it's metanoia. It means change your mind. It means you're going in one direction, turn around, go another direction. Now, I think it's primarily for saved people, that is, for God's people in any age, repentance. They are the ones that if they're going to have revival and they're cold and indifferent, they've got to turn. That was the message to the seven churches in Asia, as we saw some time ago. And it was the message of the Lord Jesus. Now, somebody says, well, isn't the unsaved supposed to repent? Not the way you think of it. He's told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul said to the Philippian jailer. And that old rascal needed to do some repenting. But you see, in faith there is repentance. You see, faith means you turn to Christ. Now, when you turn to Christ, you turn from something. And if you don't turn from something, you don't turn to him, you see. And so repentance is in the word believe today. And I think that's the primary message that should be given to the lost today is to believe. Now, a great many people like to do something. They like to put up their hand. They like to come forward in a meeting. They like to do something. And we've encouraged that, by the way. 
But to me, the most impressive thing is to stay right there in your seat, right where you are. And if you've made a decision, record it by writing it. But even signing a card doesn't save you. The important thing is to trust Christ as your Savior. And if you've really done it, if you've turned to him, you've turned from something. Now, the expression kingdom of heaven, we've talked about that before. That's the rule of the heavens over the earth. And the Lord Jesus is the king. And you can't have a kingdom without a king, and you can't have a king without a kingdom. What king was it says, my kingdom for a horse? If he traded in his kingdom for a horse, he's not a king. All he is is a man horseback. You have to have a king to have the kingdom. Now, what do you mean the kingdom of heaven is at hand? The kingdom of heaven is present in the person of the king, and that is it. Now, somebody says, isn't there a present reality of the kingdom of heaven? Yes. Those who come to him as Savior and acknowledge him are translated into the kingdom of his dear son. They belong to him now. But they have a more intimate relationship than a subject of the king. They're now part of the bride. Somebody says, well, they're to carry out his commands. They're more than that. May I say to you, they are to do it because they love him. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So that the kingdom of heaven is the rule of the heaven over the earth. That's not in existence today. Now, any man that makes that kind of a statement must be something wrong with his thinking. Or he must be totally ignorant of the world we live in. He's not reigning today in any form, shape, or fashion, only in the heart of those who accept him. They're the only ones. Now, he's coming someday to establish his kingdom on the earth. When he does, he'll put down the rebellion. And believe me, he's going to put it down. Now, the kingdom of heaven was present in the person of the king, and that was the only way it was. Now, he says, "...for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah." That is Isaiah. And you'll find it in Isaiah 43. You see how Matthew keeps telling us everything that he's recording is in fulfillment of prophecy, saying, "...the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight." That's all that John the Baptist claimed for himself. He was a voice crying in the wilderness. Now he says, "...and the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey." He's a strange individual, isn't he? Talk about one following a diet and one dressing very unusual. I hate to say this, but I want to tell you, John would probably qualify in his looks as a hippie. Just look at this. The same John had his raiment of camel's hair. His leathern girdle was about his loins. His meat was locusts and wild honey. And we're told he never shaved. Long hair. This is the man, unusual man, friends, and a man with a mission. He's an Old Testament character, walks out of the Old Testament onto the page of the New Testament. He's the last of the Old Testament prophets. Now we're going to see something about him as we go through. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. They went out to him. He did not rent a stadium or an auditorium are a church, and there was no committee that invited him. He didn't come to town at all. If you wanted to hear John, you went out to where he was. And I tell you, the Spirit of God is on this man. And they were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. In other words, all of this denoted a change in the lives of these people. The very fact of the baptism was their leaving the old life and now turning to a new one. All of this was there. Now notice something else. Verse 7, And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, and notice who was coming, he said unto them, Now this is no way to greet these dignified visitors. Listen to him. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Suppose your preacher got up next Sunday morning and said, O generation of vipers, the deacons would be looking for another preacher, I imagine. May I say this is really strong language. 
and he's talking to the dignified Pharisees and Sadducees. He cries out to them, "'Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance.'" In other words, you've got to demonstrate this. You just don't go through the act of baptism. You have to present fruit in your life. Now, he says, "'And think not to say within yourselves, "'We have Abraham to our father. "'For I say unto you that God is able.'" of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. That, my friend, was a strong statement he made there. You can understand why he was not elected the most popular man of the year in Judea. Now we come to verse 10. We are looking at John the Baptist. As he began his ministry and he introduced the Lord Jesus, he introduced him as the king, and he's the one that makes the announcement that he is present. I put in it, verse 10, "...and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire." great deal is said in the New Testament about fruit-bearing. Now, fruit-bearing is the result of having the right kind of a tree. You see... Only a fruit tree can produce fruit. And now he talks here about the fact the axe is put to the root of the tree. Why? Because it's not bearing fruit. Now, an apple tree will bear apples. Plum tree will bear plums. But when an apple tree bears thorns, it's not an apple tree. It's to be cut down. The root and the fruit go together, by the way, because it has to have the right kind of a root to bear the right kind of fruit. And so that is what he's saying here. The wrong kind of tree is going to be taken down. Now listen to him in verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, I'd like to spend a moment here. He says, I baptize with water, but he's coming, and when he comes, he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, that and there is already over 1,900 years long. We're living in the age of the Holy Spirit. He baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now, fire is his second coming, and that's judgment. That distinction needs to be made. Somebody says, well, I thought on the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit came that that was fire too because it says that the tongues of fire sat on them. Oh, my friend, you ought to read it again. It says, like as fire. And it was like the sound of a rushing mighty wind. wasn't. It was the coming of the Holy Spirit. But the thing is that there was something to appeal to the eye gate the fire, to the ear gate, the sound of a rushing mighty wind. So that when the Holy Spirit came, that was not the fulfillment of the baptism of fire. That takes place at his second coming. And you and I are living today in the age of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes upon every believer, not just some. Every believer is baptized by the Holy Spirit. That means he's identified with the body of Christ. He's part of the body of Christ. And that's one of the great truths of the Word of God. Now let me continue to read. It says, "...whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his flower and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him." This is remarkable. And we're going to ask this question and try to answer it. Why was Jesus baptized? I hope we can see that here. Will you notice? But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us, to fulfill all righteousness, then he suffered him. 
Now, what is the answer to the question, why was Jesus baptized? And I'd like to ask you that question, why was he baptized? Now, there may be several answers, but I think the primary reason is given right here. The Lord Jesus said it is essential for the fulfillment of righteousness. He's identifying himself here completely with sinful mankind. The prophet had written, he is numbered with the transgressors. Here is a king that comes down, and he's identified with his subjects. And I believe that that is the purpose of the baptism of the Lord Jesus, for the baptism means actually identification. And this is a coming down and identifying of himself here with them. He was baptized, I think, for that reason. And that, I think, is so important for us. Now, notice this again. The reason that Jesus was baptized, it's not to set us an example. It's not a pattern. Christ was holy. He did not need to repent. I do. He was holy, harmless, and undefiled, and separate from sinners. He completely identified himself with humanity, the race of mankind. He was numbered with the transgressors. Now, will you notice, his death was a baptism. You remember, he said to James and John when they wanted the place next to him, are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? His death was a baptism. He entered into death for you and me. And then the third reason He was set aside for his office as priest. The Holy Spirit came upon him here for this ministry. Everything that he did, he did it by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was made sin for us who knew no sin. There was sin on him, but there was no sin in him. My sin was put on him, not in him. That's important. And... Therefore, you and I are saved by being identified now with him. He identified himself with us in baptism, and Peter says we're saved by baptism. What? By being identified with the Lord Jesus. And that's what it means to be saved. What does it mean? Well, to be in Christ. How do you get in Christ? By the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I believe in baptism. And I think that we're to be baptized to declare that I am identified with Christ. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. We today must recognize that we have to be identified with him. And that is done by the Holy Spirit. And our baptism tells that out. An old salt one time said to a young sailor, in trying to get him to accept Christ and be baptized, he says, young man, it's duty or mutiny. (laughs) And when you come to Christ, friends, you'll be baptized because it's a duty. And if not, it's a mutiny. This is a tremendous thing. And I feel like this is something that we needed to elaborate on a little because this subject of baptism needs to be lifted out of the realm of constantly arguing and talking about it, and to get to the high and lofty plane of where today we are going to stand for him. We need to come out and stand for Christ in a very wonderful way. Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. He identifies himself. And then John suffered him. Now, verse 16, And Jesus when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and, lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And, lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And, by the way, John teaches the Trinity. You have here the Lord Jesus And the Spirit of God descends upon him like a dove. And then a voice from heaven, the Father says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. 
Now he is identified with his people. What a king. Oh, what a king he is. Now that brings us to chapter 4 here. And when we come to chapter 4, we have the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. You see, immediately, this one who's identified with us now by baptism, he has come down here, and now he came, and his birth, he's identified with us as he grew up as any other child would. But he's wholly harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. But in his baptism, he identifies himself for me. And my sin was put on him, not in him. Now, will you notice, we find here that he's being tested. The question now is, is this king able to withstand a test? Is he able to overcome? And I want to deal with a very important question here. I think probably we better deal with it first. And I think that as we look at the temptation, this might become clear. I trust it will become clear. Now, what do you mean by the temptation of Jesus? Well, temptation is a word that really has a twofold meaning. First of all, it can mean to incite or entice to evil, that is, to seduce. There is something in the individual that causes him to yield. The Lord Jesus said, The prince of this world cometh, and he hath nothing in me. Well, you see, that wasn't true of Jesus. There's something in me that causes me to yield, you see. And he was separate from sinners. So the temptation had to be different than which would come to me and cause me to fall. It had to be much greater for him. Now, the word temptation means to test. We're told, as we saw in Genesis... God did tempt Abraham. Now, God tested Abraham's faith. And God does not tempt man with evil. James says that in James 1, 13. And God never does that. Now, he's going to be tested, and it's going to be a real test. And the question arises, could Jesus have fallen? I want to answer that with a very emphatic no. He could not have fallen. Oh, I hear some strange things today on radio, and I guess that's what some of you are thinking when you hear me. But there are a lot of strange things today that are being said from pulpits, a lot of strange things. May I say to you that if Jesus could have fallen, then you and I do not have a sure Savior at all. Then somebody says to me, well, then, if he couldn't have fallen... Was his temptation a legitimate and genuine temptation? Well, may I say to you, his temptation was greater than any than you and I have ever had. They'd get out a new model Chevrolet or a new model Ford, and I better bring that in and probably say a new model Dodge. And they're tested to prove they can stand the test. You see, a genuine diamond is tested to prove that it's perfect, not to show that it's a phony. And the Lord Jesus was tested to demonstrate that he's exactly who he claimed to be. I remember as a boy, and I must tell this little story, when I was a boy, we lived out in West Texas. That's a long time ago. Sparsely inhabited area in those days. And the Santa Fe came through our little town. It didn't stop in our little town. It stopped in the next little town. Believe me, you couldn't get off at the place where I live, but it went by. And the Santa Fe crossed the Brazos River, the West Fork of the Brazos River at that place. Now, that Brazos River, in summertime, there wasn't enough water in it to rust a shingle nail. But in wintertime, you could float a battleship in it. It was that kind of a place. Now, one winter, we really had a flood, and it washed out the Santa Fe Bridge. And so we didn't have a train for a long time. But finally, they put in a bridge. Oh, they worked a long time. And then one day, they brought in two engines and put on that bridge and tied down the whistles on both of them. And believe me, that's more whistling than we'd ever heard in that little town. And all of us in this little town, we ran down there to the river, to the bridge, to see what has happened. When we got there, we saw... All 23 of us went down there, by the way. 
And we were standing around, and one brave citizen, he went up and said to the engineer in charge, what are you doing? He says, testing the bridge, because both of those locomotives were on top of the bridge. And this fellow says, what are you doing? Trying to break it down. And the engineer almost stared. He says, of course not. Well, he says, what do you mean you're testing it? He says, we're testing it to prove that you can't break it down. <laughs> May I say to you, that's exactly the way the Lord Jesus was tested to prove, to demonstrate that he could not be broken down. His testing, therefore, was greater than ours. You see, there's a limit to what we can bear. You just give me enough temptation, and finally you build up pressure, and I'll succumb to it. And that's true of you, too. But he never gave in. The pressure continued to increase. In other words, a 10-pound fishing line is broken when 25 pounds of pressure is put on it. But a 100-pound line can bear more than 25 pounds of pressure. Now, I'm the 10-pound fishing line. He's the 100 pounds. Then there's something else that's quite interesting here in this temptation of the Lord Jesus the contrast and the comparison between the testing of Eve is really interesting. To begin with, this one that took place in a wilderness, and Eve was tested in the Garden of Eden. What a contrast. Now I must read chapter 4, and I begin with verse 1. Then was Jesus led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, to be tested of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, that's the same temptation that came to Eve. The first one was physical. She saw the tree was good for food. And the Lord Jesus is told, command that these stones be made bread. Now notice his answer. But he answered and said, It's written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And that's found in Deuteronomy 8, 3. He sure knew Deuteronomy, and he believed it was the inspired word of God. Then verse 5, we have the second testing. Then the devil taketh him up in the holy city, setteth him upon a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it's written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. That's Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. Now, that's the second one. It's a spiritual temptation. The first was physical. And you'll remember that Eve saw it was desired to make one wise. Cast thyself down from the temple. And that's pride of life, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. And those are the things the Christian attempted in, you see. Now the third is psychological. Notice this, verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It's written again, Thou shalt not... Tempt the Lord thy God. And that's Deuteronomy 6, 16. Again, verse 8, The devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. That's psychological, you see. He showed him the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Believe me, man lusts for power, the lust of the eyes, the things that are in the world today. And that's the thing that Eve saw, pleasant to the eyes. Oh, I tell you, this world gets a great many of us. Notice the answer of the Lord Jesus. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it's written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, he's quoting again from Scripture, Deuteronomy 6.13 and Deuteronomy 10.20. Friends, you have our Lord answering each time Scripture, and certainly that ought to have a message for all of us. 
why is it that many of us are having trouble and difficulty living the Christian life? May I add this very kindly? It's ignorance of the Word of God. Ignorance of the Word of God. Our Lord answered by giving the Word of God. Now, I believe that the Word of God has an answer for your particular problem. That doesn't mean I know it, and that doesn't mean your psychologist knows it, and I don't think he knows it anyway. But may I say to you, God has an answer in his Word for your problem. That's the reason we ought to know the book a little bit better than we know it. The interesting thing is the Lord Jesus answered Satan every time out of the Word. He didn't say, well, I think this, or I think this is the best way to do it. He said very pointedly, very definitely, the Word of God says this. That's the answer. And for the child of God, that's enough. And by the way, the devil seems to think it's a pretty good answer, because verse 11 says, "...then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him." One of the other gospels says he left him for a little season. I think he was back the next day myself and all his life. And I think we see at the Garden of Gethsemane especially that he's there again tempting. This is important here, by the way. This temptation reveals that here is a king who can stand the test. And he is the one that is able to stand for the Lord. Here is one who can meet the devil and can overcome. That's very important. Now, I think it might be well for us to make a very brief recapitulation today and look at some things that are very clearly taught in this particular incident in the life of our Lord. First of all, we have seen he's born as a king He was introduced as a king, and he was baptized as a king, and now he's tested as a king. And all the way through Matthew, he's a king. And this testing reveals several things. First of all, the devil is a person. In this contact with Jesus, he's treated as a person. And that ought to answer the question for any Bible believer today, because sometimes the question arises, is the devil an influence or just who and or what is he? And then we've noticed the very subtle insinuation of the devil. First of all, he says, if thou be the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. In other words, prove it in a way which is not God's way. And there was no attempt, of course, to tempt Jesus to commit a crime. May I say for him, I don't think that would be a real temptation. But to do good, actually. Bread is the staff of life, and therefore to make bread would be a very good thing. Satan didn't ask Jesus here to turn water into wine. Later on, he fed the multitudes with bread. But the inherent evil was to get him to go outside of the will of God for his life. Now, the Lord Jesus, all the way through here, as we call your attention to it, answered him from the Word of God every time. In other words, he used the sword of the Spirit to meet the enemy of God and the enemy of man, for that matter. His answer was, it is written, oh, if we were only a little bit more adept at using a sword. That is the sword of the Spirit. That's our weapon today, and it's a good weapon, friends. Still a very excellent weapon. Now, he quotes from Deuteronomy. That's interesting. Did you know that when higher criticism in Germany began to level its attack against the Bible, the Grafwelthausen hypothesis level both barrels at the book of Deuteronomy. And apparently the devil hates this book because the Lord Jesus used it against him. And that's where he made his attack. Now, the second thing he did, he wanted to get Jesus to become a religious leader by a stupendous miracle 
rather than by offering his credentials in the manner that God had prescribed. The devil's way would miss the cross of Christ. And may I say that what's called Christianity today is devil entity or Satan entity because it leaves the cross of Christ out altogether. And what he's saying, become a great religious leader by a miracle. And friends, it's very dangerous to be led astray by miracle workers. Right now we have so much of that throughout our land. I do not know why so many people go after that type of thing. It is so transparent that there are not really miracles taking place. There's a whole lot of emotion and a great deal of fall to roll. I have made an offer in Southern California of $100 to anybody that will come forward and demonstrate offer their credentials that they actually were healed by a miracle worker, by a healer. And do you know, I was frankly amazed. I've had two or three that have come in, actually very sincere folk and very honest folk. And they really think I'm way out in left field because I don't believe that. Well, I don't. But don't misunderstand. I believe in miracle healing. That is... I believe that you go directly to the great physician. May I say, when you've got something serious, you don't go to an intern or a quack doctor. What you want to do is get to the specialist in that particular field. And that's the one you go to. Well, I've taken my case to the great physician. He's a good doctor, by the way. I can recommend him. And I believe in going directly to him and not through some of these so-called miracle workers. No man can perform miracles. Now, even the Lord Jesus would not become a religious leader the way the devil wanted him to become. And that's very interesting. Now, you'll notice that the devil came back and he quoted Scripture also. He came back and said, "...he'll give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up." lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. My, he's pretty good at that, is he not? The only thing is, he wasn't quite accurate. You remember Shakespeare said that the devil could quote scriptures for his purpose. Well, he was wrong. He can misquote scripture for his purpose. And he left out a very important phrase in this passage that he quoted from Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12. He left out to keep thee in all thy ways. That's the important part of the verse. You see, it was an attempt to get him to ignore God's way. It's not always God's will, friends, to work a thing in your life or my life that's miraculous. This idea today that you can force God to do something, and that God is sort of a Western Union boy, or that he is more or less working for you, and that you can command him or get him to do anything you want him to. You can't do that. God is sovereign. We happen to be the creature, and we must yield to the will of God. And that may not be pleasant at times, but the will of God is that which is all important not your will or my will. Another thing about this temptation that really raises a question, and that is the devil offered the Lord Jesus the kingdoms of this world. Now, I have a question to ask you today. Does the devil have the kingdoms of the world to offer? And you think that over before you come up with the answer. Well, let me give you my answer, and I have thought about it a great deal. The Lord Jesus never challenged whether he had the kingdoms or not to offer. He didn't say, don't offer me the kingdoms you don't have them to give. I assume that he had them to give. That gives a little different viewpoint of the trouble we're having in the world today. The devil is running everything. We're so afraid, and I'm afraid Christians get hipped on communism, and that's bad enough, by the way. But back of communism is Satan. 
and back of the confusion in the world is Satan. Let's remember who our enemy really is. And it's a spiritual enemy. And he wants to become God. He wants to become God. He said, if you'll just fall down and worship me. Now, we're told here in this last verse, "...then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him." And I think it's Dr. Luke that says he left him for a season. This doesn't mean that the devil just left him permanently. He did not. Now, I think that gives us a resume of the temptation as we look back of it. Now, let's move on from that today. And in verse 12, you'll note this. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. You see, he withdrew from Jerusalem area because John now had been taken by Herod and put in prison. And verse 13 reads, And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zabulon and Nephthalim. We have here the Lord Jesus shifting his headquarters from the south to the north and from Nazareth, his hometown, over to Capernaum. Now, Matthew does not give us the details here, and I think that you ought to notice that the Gospels are not attempting to parallel each other. One is not a carbon copy of the other. This attempt today to harmonize them is a big mistake. I have been print why four Gospels, and each one was written for a definite purpose, and not one of them was to be a biography of the Lord Jesus. No one could give that, but each presents his case to reach a certain segment of the human family. And this is to reach the religious element, was written primarily to the nation Israel. It actually was written in Hebrew. Papias and Eusebius, church fathers, both say that as well as others. Now, we find here that the Lord Jesus moved his headquarters to Capernaum, and Matthew doesn't give us the reason. We are told that actually he was rejected in his hometown. Now, he went down to Capernaum, and as far as I can tell, Capernaum became his headquarters and continued to be his headquarters until the time he went to Jerusalem for the last time to be crucified. And as far as I can tell, he never came to Capernaum after his resurrection. I don't think that he ever came there again. He had already pronounced a judgment on it because this is the place that saw so many of his miracles. And we'll see later on in this gospel, woe unto the Capernaum. Now, we have then that statement, he's moved his headquarters there. Why did he do that? Well, the other gospels will not give you the reason. But Matthew gives you the reason. Because everything he's recording, it's to show you that the Lord Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, and that everything he did, he's moving according to prophecy. And that actually we have here, therefore, the fact that he moved from Nazareth to Capernaum was all for a definite purpose. Here it is, verse 14, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, and here is the statement, if you want to find it in Isaiah, it's in the ninth chapter, the first two verses, and also in the 42nd chapter, verses 6 and 7. I'm reading verse 15 here. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. So that he went into this area. And I do not have time to develop this, but if you'd want to do some investigating, you'd find it very profitable to see the condition of that area at the time the Lord Jesus was there, when he was raised as a boy. 
It's called the Gentile country. And out of the Roman Empire, many had come into that area. It was a very wicked area. It was a very worldly section. It's a marvelous resort area around the Sea of Galilee. Now, these people in that area were very far from God. They were close to Jerusalem, but very far from God. And he goes into that area to Capernaum and not to Jerusalem to make his headquarters. To those people, here a great light breaks upon them. His very presence, of course, created a responsibility for those people, and our Lord judged them later. Now will you note verse 17. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, he picked up right where John the Baptist left off. That was here the message, Repent, turn around, come to me. The kingdom of heaven is at hand in the person of the king, of course. You couldn't have the kingdom without him. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And simply stated again, it's the reign of the heavens over the earth. These theologians today, my some of them have made this a very complicated expression. For a poor preacher like I am, it's just a very simple expression. It's just the reign of the heavens over the earth. And that's what he's going to bring to this earth someday. After all, this earth is to be heaven for an earthly people. They'll go into eternity right here on this earth. Now, the church has a heavenly hope. And actually, the earthly hope is a marvelous hope. It's the hope of the Old Testament. Now, will you notice verse 18? And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men." We have in the Gospels at least three calls that the Lord made to these men. They were called first. You find him meeting them in Jerusalem. John gives us that. Then this apparently here is the second call that was given to them. They had seen him before. The first time he never called them. But now his second meeting with them at the Sea of Galilee, he calls them. And then you'll find they went back to fishing. Mark gives us that in detail, and also Luke. And you'll find that he called them again, and that was to apostleship. That's the wonder of it all, that he called men like this. And I've always felt if he'd called men like these men, he may be able to use me. How wonderful it is to know he doesn't call perfect men. Now he saith unto them, Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Now he may not make you a fishers of men because you're not a fisher. (laughs) You're not in the fishing business. Maybe you're in some other business. But he'll use you. And whatever your talent might be, if you turn it over to him, he could use it. I used to tell a lady that was a member of my church years ago, She could bake the most wonderful cakes in the world, but she is tongue-tied when it came to talking to anybody. And she used to deplore the fact. And I said, Deborah, occur to you, maybe the Lord wants you in the church to cook cakes. Somebody says, well, that's ridiculous. No, it's not, friends. Whatever your talent is, God can use it if you'll let him use it. That's the important thing. And I don't care whether you've got a talent or not, he can use you. And he won't have us all doing the same thing because we all don't have the same gift. The body of Christ has many members in it, and they're not all the same members. Now, will you notice? And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother in a ship with Zebedee, their father mending their nets, and he called them. I'm not going to deal with these men, but in the other Gospels, we're going to get a little better acquainted with them, by the way. Very interesting men. And they immediately left the ship and their father, and they followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee. 
Now, this is in the north section now, teaching in their synagogues. He's teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. What is it? It's at hand in the person of the king. They are to accept and receive him, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Literally, friends, there were thousands of people in that day that Jesus healed. Now, we're going to see Matthew specializes in letting you know that. And if we'll pay attention to it, we'll find out there weren't just a few isolated cases. Thousands of people. That's the reason they never question his miracles. There are too many of them walking around. And by the way, I live in Southern California. I don't see many of these so-called miracles walking around. They don't seem to come my way. Verse 24, And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with demons, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. Notice the multitudes. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, from Decapolis. Now, Decapolis were ten cities on the east side of the Jordan River, and from Jerusalem. Now, they came up from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. And that means a long ways off. He is ministering there in the north. Now, we find in the next three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, we've come to the first major discourse that Matthew records. He records three major discourses, the Sermon on the Mount, and then in Matthew 13, the Mystery Parable Discourse, and then in Matthew 24 and 25, the Olivet Discourse. The Sermon on the Mount is the manifesto of the king. And the mystery parable discourse gives the direction the kingdom of heaven will take after his rejection. And then the Olivet Discourse is prophetic. It looks to the future. Now, there's another discourse in John's gospel, and that all new truth and new relationships with him. And we are vitally connected with that discourse, by the way.